on the 8th of July, 2011, Atlantis left the Earth for the last time. After 30 years and 135 missions, the Space Shuttle was making its final flight. I'm Kevin Fong, and I used to work at NASA with the Shuttle's medical research team. For the last month of this last mission, I was granted unprecedented access to the Shuttle program. It's a machine that's going to come alive very, very soon. I was with the astronauts as they went through their final weeks of training. I'm glad I'm wearing this, not that, on this yeah, evening. Yeah, it's a little warm. Bracing myself against the seat in front, dropping out of the sky like a stone here. And I found the unsung heroes who've worked on the shuttle since the beginning. After this is all gone, what's next for you? To go look for another job. And I met the man in charge of it all during one of the most extraordinary and emotional months in NASA's history. Today, this being Atlantis's last flight was really special for me. Um, this was the first, <laughs> first space shuttle I could be in. Before this era finally passes into history, I want to see what it takes to get this remarkable machine into orbit. And along the way, I want to talk to the men and women who've worked here at NASA as part of the shuttle program and understand what the last three decades has meant to them. Thirty years ago, I was, I was sitting in an assembly hall at school, watching the first shuttle launch off the Cape on a colour television, and back then, I never imagined that I'd get a chance to work here. And having done that, it's just incredible to be able to get the chance to come back and see the last shuttle launch in the last 25 days of the last flight of the last space shuttle. Thank you. I'm on my way to Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Johnson's home to the astronauts and their training ground. And it's where I used to work. <laughs> they seem to be expecting me. And I want to say hello to some friends in my old department, the Shuttle Medical Research Team. Guys, <laughs> this was your doing? Yeah, right. a little bit, a little bit. Hey, how are you? How are you? Good to see you, Good, Good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> how are you? Fine. How are you doing? Good to see you. It's good to see you. Got Gosh. your flag. Oh uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is it strange with the shuttle finishing now? Oh, I know it's sad. I hate to see that, but you've been with the program all along. Haven't At twenty-five. You? Yeah, I've been here twenty-five years. So it's weird to see it go, isn't it? I, think. I know. It, yeah. It it is sad. Today I've been invited to see the final shuttle crew and the mission control team being put through their paces. This is mission control, the nerve center for shuttle flight operations. Commander Chris Ferguson is in charge of this final shuttle crew. They have a grueling day of simulations ahead of them. It's a full dress rehearsal for their worst nightmares. This is a high fidelity, full motion simulation Everything is replicated, down to the last detail. To the crew and mission control, it will feel like the real thing. What you're seeing there is this little cabin, and on the inside, those black boxes are TVs facing into that cabin, showing them exactly the view that they're going to get during all of these launch scenarios, all of the emergency abort scenarios. They, they, they have a pretty good idea from being in that, what it's going to be like things go wrong on the day. Neither the mission controllers nor the crew know what the training team is going to serve up today. Navigating through those simulated emergencies is going to be quite a feat. Liftoff confirmed. Happy liftoff. World program, Houston. Guidance is right. Roger Happy. roll, Atlantis. This is a room full of people, each of them with a mission critical task, but the most important person down there at the moment is the flight director, Richard Jones, just sitting just off to the left there, and it's his job to orchestrate all of this to keep that crew and that vehicle safe. It's only seconds after launch, and the crew are in trouble. They've lost an engine, and there are problems with the cooling system. 
What's going on? We've lost PDL. We're back at my Looks like we got a leak. Leak on the right flight. We do see the helium leak on the right, Chunky. You're go to work the procedure. And tell him he's still hot, Mike. And you're still hot, Mike, Chunky. Crew must decide whether to proceed or abort. Flight booster. It's an upper system leak. The shuttle is past the point of no return. From here, they either continue to space or perform an emergency landing across the Atlantic. Thank you. Negative return. Atlantis, negative return. Stay out open. Stay out open, Chunky. It's a uh, tank leak. One wrong decision here, and this emergency could become a catastrophe. Press the ATO. You can select Istris. Looks like the ride will make it to 23K, Chunky. They can't make it to orbit, so decide to land in Istris, France. Okay, DPS, we have a little bit more time. That transatlantic flight would take a jumbo jet nine hours, but shuttle will do it in just 35 minutes. One more time. All right, folks, we're going to have to live with that hot mic on board. And how many launches have you overseen in your time as flight director? I've seen five before. This is going to be my sixth one. What would you say to people who shrug and they say, well, it's been flying for 30 years, space flight, human space flight, mostly has become routine. To what extent does it feel routine to you? Putting humans on top of that, that explosion, in a way, that is going on underneath it just to get it into orbit, it's just amazing. And there's, it's not even close to being routine. I now, you must have sims where everything goes wrong and theoretically the crew and the vehicle are lost. How seriously do you take those? Those are really ugly. There are scenarios sometimes that you just cannot win. Sometimes you might have to do a bailout or it's uh, a loss of control. Those, are, those feel horrible when you have to go through them, but there's so much to learn when you do go through them. They're almost like, they're like, they're pieces of gold. As the morning unfolds, the crew face launch after launch, each one featuring a new emergency. First pick up. We're going AOA. Do we need all this capability? And test up this completely. They've chucked the kitchen sink at them. During the launch simulations, they've had engine failures. They've tried to get to orbit, couldn't get to orbit. They then had to fly across the Atlantic, look for a landing site in Europe. And it's far from a foregone conclusion that this simulation is going to work out all right. Port ATO. Atlantis abort ATO. Abort ATO. This is Chris Ferguson. Chris, hey, Kevin. hi. Sorry to yeah. jump you after oh, a long, long day in front of no, me. After four hours in the sim, I get to meet Commander Chris Ferguson. He only found out in January this year that the mission he was preparing for would be the shuttle's last. So, 24 days now before you go, have you managed to believe that you're actually going to be commanding the last flight yet? I haven't counted the 24 days, but it's that close, huh? It's that close. Yeah, they're, they're coming by and uh, they're clicking off pretty quickly now. You know, I think I speak on behalf of my crew. We are extraordinarily honored and we're going to make, uh, we're going to make everyone in America very proud of the 30 years of a successful space shuttle. Of course, the last landing is going to be kind of, uh, I guess, historical. We want to make sure we, we recognize the right people at the right time when it's all over. Can you imagine that moment? We'll stop on... It's going to be hard to capture 30 years of tremendous shuttle operation in a, in a sentence or two when it's all said and done. We'll try to say something that's fitting. Have you thought about what those words are going to be? I have, but I can't let you know now. Oh, come on. No, no, I can't. <laughs> I'm in Florida on my way to Cape Canaveral. If Houston is the home of the astronauts, then Florida's Kennedy Space Center is where the rockets are kept. And it's where Atlantis will launch from in 20 days time. Since it last flew in 2010, the spacecraft has undergone a complete refit. As this mission got closer, it was transferred to the giant vehicle assembly building, where it was attached to its vast external tank and twin solid rocket boosters. A week ago, this whole assembly was transferred to the launch pad, taking five hours to make the three-mile trip. And it's there that Atlantis will undergo all the final system checks that will make it ready for launch.
Normally, it's impossible to get up close to a shuttle on the launch pad. But today, an astronaut friend from my NASA days is visiting Atlantis. That's a much better way to come to, to, come to Florida. Dan Tanney has a vital role on the ground for this mission. He's part of the Capcom team. He'll be in mission control, providing the vital communications link with the astronauts in space. Hey, Dan. Hey, crew. Greeting, crew. <laughs> nice ride. <laughs> Dan has launched on two shuttle missions. He knows this journey well. For this final flight, NASA has chosen pad 39A, the same launch pad that sent Armstrong and his crew to the moon in 1969. So on launch morning, you get out of the Astro van and, uh, you know, you stand here and you think, it's unbelievable that humans could uh, put something so complicated together. And what an incredible privilege it is, not only to stand there, but hopefully in about four or five hours, I'm going to be circling the Earth at 17,000 miles an hour. Uh, it's really awesome. You look up at the vehicle and uh, steam is coming from it. There's some creaking. There are motors that you hadn't heard before. You know, you feel like it's a beast that is uh, awakening and you get this awareness that it's a, it's a machine that's gonna come alive uh, very, very soon. At the base of the launch platform, a glimpse shuttle sleeping in its protective metal cocoon. This is the tail. The tail, of, yeah. Uh, this of, is the tail. Of the rudder. space shuttle. Yeah. Here's the rudder and the tail structure. Those tiles, I mean, they're close enough to touch, but you don't touch them. Oh, no, you don't touch anything out here, yeah. We don't touch flight hardware unless it's a requirement. For a successful shuttle launch, millions of things have to go right. If they don't, the results could be catastrophic. What you can see here in these uh, stainless steel things, there are four of them on each SRB, so there's eight all together. These are the hold down bolts that hold the entire stack, the four and a half million pounds of space shuttle and booster to the launch platform uh, on these four points. Now what's interesting is at the moment of launch, the moment the SRBs are ignited, there are pyrotechnics on the bolts and they're blown apart. release the space shuttle from the launch platform. And that's just another component that has to work. It has to work 100%. If one of those bolts were to fail, it would be a catastrophic failure. You cannot turn off the solid rocket boosters. So uh, it's a, it's a must-work function. First and last time, I'll be catching a lift at the top of the space shuttle while it's on the launch. This is the astronaut's lift, and I'm going up 195 feet to the level of the flight deck. This is it. Welcome to 195. It's where every shuttle crew has entered their vehicle on launch day, and it's a highly restricted area. Kevin, this is it. Once you're ready, and you have to be ready, uh, they'll uh, wave you in and uh, you make the walk out. That's uh, to the white room, you get ready, and, and then uh, you climb in from the white room, through the hatch, into the shuttle, get strapped in. So, Kev, here's a piece of technology that, uh, that passed us by for the first couple times we were up here, but then somebody clued us in, and they go, you know that phone up on the 195 works. It's a functional phone. and. Uh, so uh, what we started uh, getting smart and doing is uh, on launch morning, you bring a couple phone numbers with you and uh, you call your wife, hey, just about to get on the space shuttle. I'll see you in a couple weeks. Um, or I called my mom and it was a... Uh, Did you really do that? Did you really absolutely. Oh, hey, I had 20 minutes before I got strapped in. It is just beautiful up here and yeah, 200 feet in the air off the coast, you know, some sunshine, breeze in your hair, and you're parked next to a hydrogen bomb. And if you're the crew, you're just about to get into a machine for the next few days, if not few months, and leave the Earth at 17,000 miles an hour.
The astronauts are about to move to the next phase of their training, and it's time for some real flying. The two hardest feats in all of rocket science are starting and stopping. Commander Chris Ferguson and Atlantis pilot Doug Hurley are about to practice landings in a specially adapted jet that behaves exactly like a returning shuttle. And they've invited me along for the ride. Looking forward to this. Yeah, these are fun. I mean, it's, you know, we don't do a ton of suited ones, but we do a fair amount, you know, we do a lot of simulators. I'm glad I'm wearing this, not that on this yeah, evening. It's it looks pretty warm. warm. Yeah. <laughs> The shuttle returns to Earth unpowered and falls from the sky at an angle seven times steeper than a commercial jet. Our shuttle trainer, which is a modified Gulfstream II business jet, it has the exact same flying qualities as the space shuttle. Of course, in order to get the flying qualities of a space shuttle, you need to employ drastic techniques, like you need to deploy the landing gear at 30,000 feet, and the engines are actually working to push the shuttle training airplane backwards. It's a tremendous rate of descent. I still remember my first experience. It was 30,000 feet. I looked down at the runway. There was a tiny little strip right under my left arm, and I said, there is no way we are going to possibly land on that thing. And he says, OK, you ready? I'm going to show you. And uh, you know, it's amazing. You come downhill really fast, and, uh, uh, but it works. And the space shuttle's the same way. So I'm about to get on this aircraft. Chris Ferguson. Commander of STS-135 is going to take it up to 20,000 odd feet, put those engines into reverse, stick it in a 20 degree down dive, get about 10 feet off the runway as far as I can tell, pull up, go around, do that 10 times. It's going to be interesting. The shuttle is designed so it can be steered at hypersonic speeds in the upper atmosphere. But as it gets close to home, below the speed of sound, its short wings mean that it sinks like a stone. So we're on the climb on the way up to that first of those, uh, first of those approaches. Uh, we're getting ourselves up to something like 20,000 feet now, getting ready to put ourselves to that very steep dive uh, with, with the engines in reverse. Chris Ferguson's side of the cockpit is identical to the flight deck of Atlantis. There you go. That noise is the engines of this aircraft going into reverse. We're experiencing the dead weight and powerlessness of the shuttle. And looking out the window now, I am looking straight down at the ground. We're falling at 28,000 feet per minute. Way down, bracing myself against the seat in front. It feels like you're falling out of the sky here. And just a few feet from the ground, we pull up and soar back into the sky. Mission commander has to complete at least a thousand of these practice runs before they fly the real shuttle. Chris Ferguson has completed 1,400. And off we go again. It's just an incredible ride. It's just amazing. That is the craziest thing I think I've ever done. That was, that was an hour and a half of going 28,000 to zero, 28,000 to zero, 28,000 to zero. Um, it was just incredible, just incredible. And the thing just drops out of the sky like a rock. And you're being flown by the guy who's about to command the last space shuttle.
During its mission, there are many phases when the shuttle is under extreme stress. The fierce heat of re-entry is more than enough to destroy an unprotected vehicle. On the 1st of February, 2003, Space Shuttle Columbia was due to return from a 16-day mission. In Columbia, Houston, we see your tire pressure copy. messages and we did not copy your last. Is it instrumentation, Max? Uh, by Max, yeah. are also off the yeah. Columbia, Houston, UHF comm check. In the skies above Texas, Columbia broke up as she hit the upper atmosphere. Her insulating shield had been damaged on takeoff and she could not survive the heat of re-entry. All seven crew members were lost. Terry White has worked on the shuttle's thermal protection system since the beginning. His last job is to make Atlantis ready for mission. With Atlantis on the launch pad, he showed me around another shuttle, Discovery, which flew her last mission in February 2011. The orbiter sees extreme temperature of about 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit on re-entry, so it's really important to have the thermal protection system intact to make sure that the orbiter, its payload, and the astronauts get home safe. All right, where do you take one of the tiles off of the vehicle? This is what it would look like. That's a lot lighter than it looks like it should be. That feels a bit more like a polystyrene block. Yes, that's the closest thing it's similar to. These are easily damaged. You can actually hear one when I push my thumb into it. You can hear it crack. The coating is about the thickness of an eggshell. Now this is one of the new towers. Yeah. This one's so strong you can actually bang it on the end of the table. And these were developed after? Uh, they were developed before the Columbia incident, but we started using them after the Columbia incident. That was a way to make the vehicles even safer. So if you want a, a new tile, just one tile on the vehicle, end to end, from start to finish, how it, long would that take? It takes 10 days to two weeks, depending on where it's at. But the, One yeah, tile? One tile. How, now, long, yeah. how long did it take to put 24,000 on? <laughs> a couple of years. And uh, they're about to send this to the museum. What, after this is all gone, after these processing facilities are empty, what, what's next for you? To go look for another job. Uh, uh, I've been doing this for 33 years, but I'm not quite ready to retire, so I'll go look for something else to do. The last three decades have seen an extraordinary team of specialists like Terry come together, each an authority in their own field, each one dedicated to a particular system needed to make the shuttle what it is. And with no new craft fully developed to take manned spaceflight to the next level, this unique group of people will have to be broken up. Today, the astronauts have arrived in Florida for a dress rehearsal. Right, Permission to go aboard? You. Absolutely. Permission to go aboard. Have a great day, guys. It's the first time they'll enter the shuttle on the pad. Right in, boss. How are you doing? Great, man. You look marvelous. <laughs> Waiting for them is another specialist team, the closeout crew, who make sure that the astronauts are fully equipped and ready for launch. These guys have obsessive attention to detail as a job requirement. They must check every last aspect of the astronauts' equipment, powering their flight suits and strapping them into the vehicle. You are literally the last people on Earth the crew see before they go. We connect with them when they come in there, and uh, we make it a point to connect with them because we want to make them comfortable. We're there for them and uh, to help them do their job. All right, I'm going in. She's going in, look out. Coming aboard. We've got to know several over the years, and I've uh, got to be real good friends with a lot of them. We want to do it, you know, but we're not going to get the shot, you know. So uh, when we see them do it, we love it, you know, and we connect with all of them the best we can. One of my biggest jobs that I'm going to have on launch day is 
accounting for him to make sure he's not in there when I close the hatch. Because <laughs> he would go and fly on it, you know, as we all would. We would love to. <laughs> That's my main job, my main checklist. <laughs> And then the last thing we do is we look at the commander in the window, and he's usually laying there, and he gives us thumbs up, he or she. And uh, we like that part. We get to wave to him, and, and then we go down the elevator, and we go over here in this field, and we wait. We have to uh, close and lock the hatch. And this is the tool that you use to do that. And uh, This is the key to the space shuttle. This is the key to the space shuttle. This is called the locking T tool and turn it 450 degrees, and then you lock it right there from the outside, and you push these tabs and remove it. How many of these do you have? 18. Always good to have spare keys for the space shuttle, I should yes. imagine. I just quite like, quite like this uh, remove before flight label. You don't want to take off with a key still in the door. No. <laughs> Launch is getting ever closer, so I'm lucky to be able to grab lunch with Rex Walheim, another member of the Atlantis crew. I want to know how being an astronaut affects those closest to them. It's really tough on the families, and right? how's your family cope? And my kids, since they really can remember, I've been an astronaut, so they've always uh, known this is part of my job. And the first time I told them, I didn't tell them for a few days that, hey, I'm going to the space shuttle, you know, and I'll be gone for a couple of weeks. You know, I kind of told them in their rooms, and they were, you know, three and five at the time. And, uh, and they kind of like, okay, you know, it's like everybody does that. So it wasn't a real big deal for them. And it's kind of a big memory now. But since then, they kind of know this is what Dad does. Who finds it hardest out of, out of everyone? On launch day? On launch day, the spouses. Definitely the spouses. It's, it's hard on them, especially my wife. Uh, it's, it's hardest on them. They understand uh, what we're going through, and it, they don't have a sense of control over it like we do when we're in the cockpit. Did, did, you, did you know her when you got selected, or did you meet her? Yes. When I, was, when I was first dating her, I told her I was applying to be an astronaut. And uh, <laughs> being the type who, who tends to worry a little more than others, uh, it was really kind of funny that she ended up being married to someone who's an astronaut. So Will she be glad when you finally stop flying? Yes, I think uh, when I'm done doing the, the flying in space stuff, she'll be very happy about that. In less than a week, the astronauts will arrive in Florida for the final time. They'll go into quarantine in dedicated, if somewhat spartan, crew quarters, where every astronaut since Apollo has spent their last days on Earth. Cameras are rarely allowed here, but before the crew of Atlantis arrive, my friend Dan Tanny gives me a guided tour. This is really our home away from home down here. It's awesome. When you, when you come down and fly T-38 in, uh, the crew will, and then you make the drive over here and uh, just make this walk. And once you get in the elevator, you think, oh, this is unbelievable. This is, this is a real thing. Dan introduces me to Gloria and Dolores, two of the most important people to the astronauts in isolation. All right, so first of all, these are the folks that keep us happy down here, and you want happy crew because they provide the food. Uh, one of the things that we do in the kitchen is to try to make everything as homemade as we possibly can. And everything that we feed them and put on weight, they put on weight, yeah. they lose up in space. Well, so. We try to, yeah. we try to. <laughs> one of the things that, you know, I didn't know, uh, but we, about a week before launch, there was a sheet that came around and says, what kind of sandwich do you want, you know, on orbit? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, sandwich? <laughs> what? Yeah. And, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, ham and cheese, I guess. And, and so the morning of launch, these folks make sandwiches for the crew, Frickin pack them away in a bag, mm -hmm. and they're on the shuttle with us, uh, under the seat, you tie it to the seat so that it doesn't float away, mm -hmm. and then uh, uh, as soon as you get into orbit, take off your suit, you can have a sandwich. And I didn't know that, so it's- And you also have ham and cheese. Yeah. Uh, mine was ham and cheese. <laughs> but, but, and the biggest majority of them, peanut butter and jelly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's a sin to say that. The quarters are set up especially for each new crew. I meet manager Judy Cooper in the astronaut common room. Judy has been here since the beginning, looking after astronauts and their families in the run-up to launch. I've been here since um, STS-1. I came on board in 1979. And it was the most exciting thing that you could ever, ever imagine. Everybody you ran into, every engineer, every tech, every astronaut, it, it didn't matter where they worked, they would have done it for free. That's how cool it was. I mean, you're, you're working on the space shuttle. What else could be better than that?
I asked Judy about the toughest times she's faced here, and she spoke about the first shuttle accident, Challenger, in 1986. I was up on the LCC roof watching it. The families were there. Uh, and I remember looking up, and somehow you know. You know, you, you don't know the minute you realize it because I think you kind of go into shock. And lift off, lift off of the 25th Space Shuttle mission and it has cleared the tower. Challenger exploded 73 seconds into flight in the skies above Florida. Challenger, go and throttle up. fault in one of the solid rocket boosters caused a catastrophic failure. Flight Fido, go ahead, RSO reports, vehicle exploded. Copy. All seven crew members, including NASA's first civilian astronaut, were lost. sad because this was such a great crew you know and to me they're still great and I'm so glad that what they sacrificed could mean something because we learn from that like everything else you're never ever going to make human space exploration completely safe it's always going to be like this. This is a memorial to all of the NASA astronauts who have died either while training or on mission. And look at that monument. There is plenty of space for more names. It will always be like this. Exploration will always be risk. And without risk, there is no progress. First Challenger and then the Columbia accident cast long shadows over the program and caused NASA to search its soul. They sought to learn from their mistakes and make shuttle ever safer. With the flight of Atlantis days away, I want to see one of the more recent weapons in that armory. Kenny, this is, uh, this is your office here. This is it. If you will, uh, let's open this up and just undo those snaps and uh, we'll show the cameras. Kenny Allen is a specialist cameraman. So we can uncover. On launch day, he'll be one of the closest human Why beings not? to Atlantis. This is our camera tracking map. After Columbia, NASA invested $39 million in specialist digital images. The pictures taken reveal in minute detail any damage the shuttle experiences during launch. The whole, the whole system is, is top notch. You, you won't find anything better than this anywhere in the world right now. There's no way. And Kenny, I see a seat in the middle of this, so that's, that's your throne for the day. On launch day, I come out here and I sit in the seat and we hear the countdown and it, it's getting exciting and everything's, you know, nerve wracking. And as soon as the shuttle lifts off and the sound comes in, your clothes, everything, it, it just starts pounding. And you can see I'm in this little enclosed area and the sound waves start coming in here. And it really feels like somebody's just punching on my chest, you know, it's neat. And then at liftoff, I'm concentrating right on the joystick and I look through the scope and I just, I'll track throughout the uh, duration of the flight. And then as it goes up and I track down and I stop, it's like, yes, all right, we did another one, you know, and then they gotta rush off to go see what you did. Immediately after launch, Kenny's images can be analyzed frame by frame. This is where we record uh, the video that shot out on the KTM. This is Tim Terry. Hey, Tim. Uh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. The, the imagery is stunning, there's no doubt. Uh, but it's not stunning just for stunning sake. There's groups of engineers looking at different parts of the shuttle, just like I'm doing here, frame by frame. And they all have their own little interests, their own little department, and they all are looking at things in the minutest of detail every launch. If the shuttle's tiles were found to be severely damaged, NASA could make a call whether to undertake repairs in space 
or offload the crew to the International Space Station and abandon the shuttle. Now you have all these cameras trained on this vehicle because of a catastrophic accident. Well, if you go back and look at, at the history, 135 space shuttle missions, we've had two mishaps. On the Challenger, the only thing that found out what happened, or the only thing that identified what happened was photo. And in the same thing with Columbia, when the, when the uh, foam hit the wing, you know, it was seen. But what we're here for at the end of the day is to say that's, that shuttle's safe. It, it's not damaged in any way. It's flying, and we're going to bring those guys home. With four days to go, the crew of Atlantis arrive at Cape Canaveral on American Independence Day. That's Chris and Sandy arriving in the jet on the right, and uh, Rex and Doug uh, on the jet on the left. Uh, and they're in quarantine now, which means that nobody except for frontline mission operations personnel or close family are allowed within 10 feet of them. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I think it's wonderful that you've all come out to join us when I know, and I certainly hope that you'll have an opportunity to go home and uh, when this is all done and enjoy some barbecue, some fireworks, and, uh, and some apple pie. The crew now in quarantine, I wanted to find out what goes through the mind of an astronaut as they step away from the public gaze and think of the mission they're about to embark upon. So I went to meet with Dan Tanney again and two astronaut friends he trained with. Over the last decade, Dan has spent over four months in space. Greg Chamitov put the last bolt in the International Space Station. And British-born Piers Sellers has clocked up over 40 hours in spacewalks. If we go through the arithmetic on it, this is amongst the most risky jobs outside of the military during war there is. I don't even like watching uh, other people's launches, you know, if I'm back here. I never enjoyed it. You know, seeing a launch, it, it just made me nervous. And it's, a, it's a dangerous business. Anybody who tells you otherwise is lying. And uh, launch is probably about the most dangerous phase. And the more you know about the vehicle, and the more you know about all, all the, uh, the very small margins, uh, you know, there's a lot of risk. So when you're watching, it's nerve-wracking. When you're in it, it's great. Yeah. Because you're, you you're going in. <laughs> you're, you're, you've got to proceed. You have something to do. You have right. a job. <laughs> <laughs> Explain that a bit to me, because you know what can happen. You've seen what can go happen. And yet your launches, that's not in your mind. You know, they say when you climb Everest, you know the places where people fell on off and been killed. And for shuttle, both my launches, you, you listen for go at throttle up and you know that this is the moment, right, that you lost Challenger. And then when you're coming back home and you're coming through Mach 19, you know this is when we yeah. lost Columbia. So you have these, you pass these moments and yeah. I mean, for me, there was certainly relief past go at throttle up and, and coming in past 19 where you think, wow, you know, I'm, it, yeah. not, you know, it, not that that same thing's gonna hit you, but, but here, this was the moment and, uh, and you know, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be past it. I never felt the sort of an active sense of jeopardy, you know. I mean, I guess it was been there in the background, but I never really paid attention to it. And then coming down on the shuttle, and it wasn't until I got, you know, you know, we touched down, and all of a sudden this, I just felt this relief, you know, that must have been c collected for months yeah. about, I'm really home, I'm really going to be back, I'm really going to see my family again, it's really over, it's you know, yeah. we really got back down safely. This is the question that... You know, everybody outside the fence is always going to ask. 30 years of shuttle, 135 flights. Why did you do it? Why did we do it? It's, it's raised our ability to do things in space from a very rudimentary level to an extremely ambitious level. And now look what we do. I mean, we have pretty much building sites up there with these gigantic arms flying around doing things. So it's, it's raised the level of technology and engineering enormously for 30 years so that when we do get around to doing something further out, we'll have a big repository of, of, of knowledge and experience to build on. The world's news crews are gearing up for launch day. The astronauts and the hardware are nearing their state of readiness. But there's one thing that's still out of NASA's control. So worrying news, 48 hours to launch, uh, and I've just heard there's a 60% chance that the thing won't launch because of the weather conditions. After all that engineering, all that technology comes down to clouds and rain. 
just going to find out what's happening. Kathy Winters is NASA's chief weather officer. I wish I had better weather for the forecast, but it is not uh, looking favorable right now. We're going to have some showers and even potentially some thunderstorms in the area by launch time. I'm Kevin Fong, BBC. Y you have to understand what. We're British, so we only ever talk about the weather. Uh, uh, and you're the most important weather woman in the world for me today. So I just wonder what it's like to feel the pressure of getting this forecast right, Cathy. I wouldn't call it pressure. I call it exciting. It's really more of an exciting situation we get into. Um, it's not. It's not really, I guess, a feeling like stress until maybe afterwards, and you're kind of big <laughs> let down if you do happen to scrub. But, but so that's kind of how it how it is. The next stage in Atlantis's countdown to launch is to get fuel aboard its giant external tank. But over the whole of the next day, the weather takes over. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to realize that having lightning coming down when you're filling a vehicle with thousands and thousands of tons, here we go, of uh, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, it's a dangerous thing. At the moment, they're trying to get the rotating service structure back away from the vehicle so they can get access to it to get the fuel on board. But they need to have no lightning and better weather than this. And if that process slips by more than four or five hours, they're going to have to rethink the whole thing, possibly going to have to scrub. This is a bit crazy in here today, Jeff. Absolutely. Sorry, Atlantis' mission is to rendezvous so, with the International right. Space Station. But to do that, she has to launch at just the right time. I'm seeing lightning, I'm hearing thunder. Do you really think there's any chance you're getting off the ground tomorrow? Well, the, I think the weather we got that's coming in tomorrow, what people have said, there's some breaks in that weather in between. And, and we only need her. Like, it doesn't matter how bad it is beforehand. It's when we get to that T0 time frame. In, in any given day, how long is the window in which you can launch? Normally it's about 10 minutes long. It's designed to be 10 minutes long. When you're trying to hit an object going 17,000 miles an hour, the, the ability for you to get to that point in space at the same time they are, starting from zero, is really a challenge. So you have to shoot at just the right spot, at just the right angle, so you have enough of uh, propellant and enough of capability on board to be able to steer that vehicle to meet the, the station at the right time, because otherwise you're not going to hit it. It's the day before launch, and taking advantage of a brief break in the weather, the launch control team decide to press ahead and peel back the orbiter's protective shield. She's now ready for fueling, and I get my first proper look at Atlantis. If the weather holds, Atlantis will be fueled overnight, ready for launch tomorrow. In the early hours of the morning, I get the call. Atlantis has been fueled. Countdown will begin. Four o'clock in the morning, morning of launch. It's, it's kind of strange. I, I didn't really think that I would feel anything particular this morning. But I don't know, as time goes on, I sort of start to feel like the people we've been talking to. A bit happy, a bit sad. Oh, there's, there's a small part of me that doesn't want it to go today because, you know, then the end doesn't have to start so soon. Tired. It's quite unexpected. As I arrive at Kennedy, I see Rene and Travis from the closeout crew preparing to leave for shuttle on the launch pad. Hey. <laughs> How are you? Great. You ready for this this morning? Yes, sir. Ready. Do you think the weather's going to hold for you today? Uh, you know, it's above my area of expertise. So. I've had flight crews out there in the rain before, and uh, we ended up launching. So I've seen perfect weather. We ended up scrubbing for a towel site, you know. So who knows? It's a space business. That's what we're in. Uh, if it cooperates, we'll get her off the ground safe. You know, if it's not safe, we won't go. As dawn breaks, the odds of a successful launch have fallen to 30%. The launch window opens at 11.21 a.m. If the weather forecast for that time isn't good, countdown will be scrubbed. But that hasn't stopped the public turning out in force. Final history here, Magic 107.7 with the space shuttle launch. Traffic is backing up pretty much.
At 7.35 a.m., Chris, Doug, Rex and Sandy leave crew quarters for the three-mile journey to the launch pad. There they go. They spent their last night on Earth. The building just behind me. They're off to the pad now. And hopefully on their way to space in a couple of hours' time. There's so much riding on this launch today. The end is hard enough. No one wants to go through countdown for it to be cancelled at the 11th hour. Up on level 195, Rene and Travis are there to meet the astronauts and prepare them for flight. In Houston's mission control, Richard Jones tells his team to expect a decision. We're getting close, folks. Expect a, a go, no go in the next 10 or 15 minutes. At the one mile mark, Kenny is primed and ready. And by the countdown clock, Terry White is watching. For opening the vent doors? Yeah. OK. And that takes you to 910. With the astronauts strapped in and the door locked, everyone is waiting to hear the weather all clear from launch director Mike Lineback. OK, guys, let's get ready. OK, Fergie, uh, we're starting to feel pretty good down here on the ground about this one today. So on behalf of the greatest team in the world, uh, good luck to you and your crew on the final flight of this true American icon. Entity with that, you are clear to launch Atlanta. I copy that, sir. Thank you. T minus nine minutes and counting. You know, despite all the weather there, I mean, that cheer that you're hearing out there is everyone being told that we're still go for launch. So they've dodged around the weather, the rainstorms, the thunderbolts, the lightning. It looks like it might just be clear enough. And they're going to begin the final countdown to launch. The giant vent hood is one of the last connections between Atlantis and the launch pad. When it's removed, liftoff can begin. O2 flow. T minus 35, 33. Clock will hold at T minus 31 seconds due to a failure. I do. Flight, we're holding at 31. Final copy. The launch is suddenly held. A sensor is saying that the giant vent hood hasn't retracted and locked. Uh, to verify using a camera, and we're positioning camera 62 right now. So, so it's getting pretty desperate now. There are two minutes left uh, in the launch window, 31 seconds still on the clock. They have less than two minutes to find out if the sensor is faulty or if the hood is indeed blocking the launch of Atlantis. Launch control hunt for a view of the hood, and a decision is made. This is CMAC. We verify uh, retracted. 31 seconds still on the clock. No, 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 no. Clock has started again, uh, so we're 31 seconds to launch. TLS is go for auto sequence start. For a set is counting. Copy. 10 seconds.
Atlantis, go at throttle up, no action, DPDT. Go with throttle up, no action on DPDT. Single engine, Zaragoza, 104. Two minutes after launch, the solid rocket boosters detach and fall back to the sea. Negative return. Atlantis, negative return. Miko, Miko confirmed. Happy Miko. Now standing by for external tank separation. As she pushes through the Earth's upper atmosphere, Atlantis detaches from its Atlantis external tank. tank. Chris, Doug, Sandy and Rex are in orbit. Atlantis's final mission to the International Space Station would last 13 days. Atlantis station on the big loop, we have you in sight. Excellent, we'll be there soon. The crew deliver over four tons of food, water and equipment that will allow the space station to be manned for another year. In Houston, my friend Dan Tanney is Capcom, the astronaut's connection to Earth. Atlantis crew on the ISS, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? What advice do you have for kids wanting to get into NASA and get in the field? Well, I think our advice would be just to uh, work really hard in school, especially in uh, science and math, because that's very, very important in, uh, in this business. Sandy, Chris, could you guys turn a flip for us in zero gravity? <laughs> All right. Look at Chris. <laughs> I love it. There you go. I like the socks. Very That's nice. Awesome. Very nice. <laughs> America now want the commercial sector to take over space station delivery runs, freeing NASA to develop new spacecraft to take humans beyond low Earth orbit. Until then, astronauts traveling to the space station will go on Russian vehicles. NASA's vehicle assembly building is one of the largest structures in the world. But it now lies empty, and with no immediate successor to shuttle, it's uncertain what will fill this void. It's sort of eerie being here. This place, ordinarily between missions, would have been a flurry of activity while they processed a vehicle, but it's empty now. And all of this huge, beautiful, specifically engineered infrastructure is never going to be used to build a shuttle again. After eight days aboard the space station, Atlantis and her crew prepare to leave. They still have to face the challenge of re-entry and landing. Uh, we're glad to be headed home, and uh, we're happy to serve with you. We'll see you then. Very good, thanks a million. We'll see you back home. Take care, have a safe flight. It's 5.45 a.m., Kennedy Space Center, and Atlantis is on her way. Chris Ferguson has to wrestle with a hundred tons of unpowered shuttle. I know exactly what the view looks like from up there, but this time it's for real. They'll get one shot at the landing strip today. This is where all of that practice in the shuttle training aircraft is going to pay off. They, they, they really have to get down and they only have one opportunity to do so. Landing here down and locked. The last landing of Atlantis is perfect. Nose gear touchdown. And, that, and, that, and that's it. 30 years of space shuttle program as it comes to a halt there. The whole thing comes to an end. After uh, serving the world for over 30 years, the space shuttle turned its place in history and it's come to a final stop. Thank you, Columbia, Challenger, Discovery Endeavor and our ship Atlantis. Thank you for protecting us and bringing this program to such a fitting end. God bless all of you. God bless the United States of America. It's a difficult day for everyone, including someone I've known for many years, Charlie Bolden, the head of NASA. He's had to convince the world that it's the right time for shuttle to come to an end. Oh, how you doing? Charlie, good to see you. Great to see oh, you. Fantastic, fantastic. Thanks for talking to me. Well, do you think that we'll ever see a vehicle as complex and as capable as a space shuttle again? You know, shuttle is an incredible technological marvel. 
but one of its one of its drawbacks was its complexity and and it's a vehicle that required thousands literally thousands of people just to prepare it for flight what we're going to do hopefully in the future is simplify the design uh, make them technologically superior so that it doesn't take an army of people to prepare a vehicle and to fly it and to recover it. But Charlie's also a former astronaut, a veteran of four shuttle missions. This being Atlantis' last flight was really special for me. Um, this was the first, <laughs> first space shuttle like a man, so, so that made it really special. Um, but as the, as the administrator of NASA, you know, my job is to do what I don't do very well, and that's to stand in front of people and try not to be emotional. Uh, I don't, you know me a long time, and I'm just not a person who cannot be emotional. I, uh, uh, I love these people. Uh, I love the vehicles. I love the program. I love what they stand for. The final shuttle mission marks the end of an incredible era. This week, NASA will let go of thousands of its brightest and best. Like me, they got an opportunity to do the flying but we owe an incredible debt of gratitude to the thousands, literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of folk around the country who made all this possible. Toughest thing for you today? Yes, it is. 32 years ago, I was loaned to this building for three weeks to work on the shuttle. 32 years later, tomorrow I clear the last things off my desk and I am no longer an employee at Kennedy Space Center. It's very tough. What are people going to remember Shuttle for? What is its legacy going to be? You know, all they have to do is go outside on a clear night at the right time, and they can see the space station go over, and couldn't have been done without the shuttle. I hope it's remembered as, as the biggest, proudest icon of, of America. I really do. Nobody else has done it. I want to thank that what we have done here, what we have accomplished, will lead to something equally as great. And I choose to look at it that way. You gonna miss shuttle? Sure, in a way. But again, I, I have to look forward. You can't, you can't spend time looking backwards. You gotta look, gotta keep looking forward. So for me, shuttle is more than a machine. And having spent a month in the company of the people who made it happen, I've come to realize that its legacy is far richer than I ever imagined. You know, it's, it's not the science or the engineering. It's not the accidents. It's not even the space station shuttle was always more than that. It changed the way we saw the universe. It inspired everybody whose lives it touched. And it taught a generation to dream. So that, for me, is its legacy. It is the bridge to all our futures. And to delve further into space, a selection of programs charting America and Russia's attempts to reach for the moon and beyond are available now on BBC iPlayer. <laughs>